Hello and welcome to this Union Solidarity International web conference. We are speaking to the eminent and prescient Greek economist Yaris Varoufakis, who um, several months ago we spoke to him and he told us about his modest proposals for solving the Eurozone crisis. Unfortunately, it sounds like the leaders of uh, Europe have not listened to those proposals because um, things appear to be getting worse. And the last time we spoke to you, Yanis, it was just before the Greek election and uh, we've seen an election now and we've seen things getting worse. We've seen the Greek economy contracting further and uh, as you predicted in the last conversation, we've seen Golden Dawn and, and those kinds of organizations become even more, more prominent. So. Um, Thank you, Yanis, for, for joining us, and um, yeah, and uh, give us an idea about, about where we are and, and where we're going. Well, perhaps the most promising development of the last few weeks is the rift between the International Monetary Fund and Europe. Because under pressure from the BRICS, from Brazil, from India, from China, and to some extent from the United States. The International Monetary Fund, which is owned effectively by these countries, and to a much, much lesser extent by Europe, uh, had to come clean. You see, you will recall that uh, the IMF came out of the Southeast Asia crisis and the Latin America crisis effectively without one iota of credibility. It had become the villain of the planet. And it was seen as both misanthropic and inefficient. Every prediction it had made had tanked. Every policy that it had forced upon the people of South Korea or of Argentina ended up in human catastrophe. And the, those three letters, IMF, effectively the acronyms of, the, of a swear word in Southeast Asia and Latin America. Now, that part of the world, Asia and Latin America, is the growth source of the capitalist global economy. And the IMF cannot afford to just concentrate its uh, activities on Greece and on Portugal and on Ireland. It needs to maintain, um, well, to, re to, to recover its image in Asia and Latin America. The good news is that um, there has been a change, significant change in personnel in some of part of, its, of the research departments of the IMF. And what the new blips has infused into this appalling organization is a sense of urgency to stop, firstly, making predictions that are proven in a very few months to be spectacularly erroneous, and secondly, to stop pushing policies which will fail with probability 100%, which is exactly what the the IMF has been doing both in the rest of the world and in Europe over the last three years. Now, Mrs. Lattard understands that the IMF is experiencing an existentialist crisis. Its future depends on regaining some credibility uh, in Asia and in Latin America. And therefore, Mrs. Lattard has had to steer a rather independent course vis-à-vis -vis Europe. And effectively to confront you, you can say, stop what you're doing in the periphery of Europe, because it's um, jeopardizing the IMF's uh, credibility. Because let's face it, when, whenever a major global financial institution like the IMF constantly makes predictions that are proven wrong, mm -hmm. and reliably helps the ECB, the European Central Bank, and, and, the, and, and the Europeans in general, implement policies in Spain and in Portugal which fail a few short weeks later. This is not good news for that. Mm -hmm. um, the tragedy is, just look at my country, Greece. Here you have uh, a European Union which is completely committed to what I call the fiscal waterboarding of Greece, to bring it to the edge of death and then give it in a few breaths before it sub subjects it to exactly the same kind of torture. And again, just like CIA was doing after 9-11 to its suspects, you, know, you, you bring them to the edge of death 120 times a day and, and then they will tell you anything you want them to say. So this is what's happening now with Greece. It's been happening for a while. Now, interestingly, the creditors of Greece that are doing that are the European Union 
and the IMF. And they've been waterboarding fiscal in Greece now for a while, and they're doing it in Greece. Just at the time when the IMF, one of those two partners in crime, in torture, have effectively um, taken a few steps back, and they tell the other partner, the European Union, let's stop doing this. It is incredible that the Greek government, the Athens government, is taking the side of the European Union. Only the, yesterday I was debating uh, on Greek television via Skype. The, the, the government spokesman, the official Greek government spokesman, who remarkably said that, oh, it's none of our business to take sides in this rift between the IMF and the European Union. This, these are internal matters amongst our creditors. Now, in any estimation, in anyone's books, this is high treason on behalf of the Greek government. But this is what we have. We have treacherous governments in Greece, in Italy, in Spain, in, less in Italy, but definitely in Portugal, in Ireland. They are more royalists than the king. <laughs> they seem to be um, participating with moral enthusiasm in the fiscal torture and economic torture of their populations. Mm -hmm. They are just like the... Uh, Quislings and uh, the, you know the collaborator governments under the Nazi occupation. It's pretty appalling. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, thank you, Yanis. Um, I think that that gives us a, a good insight into into what's happening. And it's always good to hear splits among your enemies. I guess uh, the question is what what can we do to maximize those and use that to provide a bit of breathing space um, for for Greece and also to the other countries who are experiencing the same thing. Um, just to say to anyone um, listening here that you're welcome to ask questions. Um, the easiest way might be just to type the questions into the box um, or you can speak them as well, it's up to you. But if anyone has a specific question for Yanis, um, you're welcome to type that. Um, Janis, since we last spoke to you, we've had some really interesting conversations with a number of other um, economists we've spoken to, Stephanie Kelton, Michael Hudson, um, Heine Flasbeck, and uh, Steve Keane. And uh, the consensus is clearly growing um, that austerity does not work, and there is so much evidence against it. I think that we've we've won the intellectual argument, the, 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 the challenge is how do we win the... The propaganda argument and the uh, and the political argument, the the um, what happens on the on how how do we actually change politics? And I'm wondering if you have a view on the big strike that Europe saw yesterday. There was the big strike, particularly across uh, southern Europe, general strike in in Portugal and Spain, stoppages in Italy and uh, and Greece and and uh, other solidarity actions. Whether you think this might help to build a, a wave of of, of political resistance to, to, what's, uh, to what's happening. It is the only way and the only means. Mm -hmm. The reason why for three years now the elites of Europe have been inflicting enormous human cost and damage on their populations, damage which will eventually uh, operate as a boomerang and hit them on the head too. Uh, it's not, let's face it, they're not even serving their own interests, at least in the long run. The only, way of, uh, the, the only reason why they've been allowed to carry on these comedy errors and to propagate these misanthropic policies, uh, like children trying to push the rubbish under the carpet, hoping that no one can notice, is because the peoples of Europe have let them do it. They have not responded in a way that sends them the signal that uh, they are simply not going to be re-elected if they carry on this way. Uh, Mr. Juncker, the head of the Eurogroup, poignantly said some time ago that we know what needs to be done in Europe. It's just we don't know how to do it and still get re-elected. You may recall that famous and very uh, honest statement. Well, what he is implying is that he believes that if the right policies are adopted, then the powerful interests 
that will be damaged by the right policies will overthrow them. Well, now, I think what we need to do is to provide them with a fear that if they don't do what is right, then the popular forces of Europe will overthrow them, and the popular forces of Europe will manage to coordinate one with one another so as to pose a greater fear in the mind and hearts of the powers that be than the vested interests do at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, that sounds really good, Yanis. Um, I just see we, we've got a question that's coming from Xenophon, who is asking, um, in Germany, people or even politicians reject propositions for the solution of the crisis from the other side of the Atlantic, saying Americans want to destroy a competing world reserve currency. Do you think that's a feature at all? Do you think the... the um, the euro is seen as competition to 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 the dollar, and it's in in any way in the U.S. interest to see it weakened. This is typical paranoid para, paranoid thinking on behalf of Europeans. Europeans is labor under a major illusion. The illusion is that the European Union and the euro is something that we Europeans constructed in order to somehow uh, counter the dominance of the United States. And we're doing this against the interests of the United States. Mm -hmm. I can't imagine of a fallacy, a historical fallacy, greater than this in the history of humanity. Uh, the, the European Union is an American construction. It was the United States of America which, after the Second World War, set about to create the European Union. They took French and German heads and smashed them against one another until they agreed to create the European Union. First through the Steel and Coal Association, and then later with the Treaty of Rome and so on and so forth. Mm -hmm. The Americans were always steadfastly behind the formation of the European Union. They were the architects of the German recovery after 1953, after a massive debt write down right off, in favor of Germany, they have been working behind the scenes to prop up Europe and to prop up the euro. And we Europeans keep thinking that this is something we created against the United mm -hmm. States of America. Now, there are, of course, competing interests. But to say that the United States is machinating and conniving behind the scenes to bring the euro down because it fears that the euro is going to steal the thunder from the dollar it's just complete silliness. Mm -hmm. the, the, the fear one thing, and that's the disintegration of the euro. Mm -hmm. Because if the euro disintegrates, then the euro is going to descend, it's going to be split up in two parts, the inflationary part east of the Rhine and north of the Alps, and the stagflationary part everywhere else. Mm -hmm. And the impact of that on China and America is going to be tremendously bad. And let's face it, the Americans are having their own problems, uh, they have serious political failures here between the Congress and the White House, and you have poor Ben Bernanke trying to get the show on the road by means of quantitative easing. He just has one lever. Imagine trying to steer a huge ship with one lever. Not even steering uh, is available to him. And the last thing they want is the collapse of the euro. Now, the notion that the euro um, is a threat to the dollar is absurd. It's an absurdity. The euro is a pillar of the dollar's dominance. Mm. And, you know, the world is large enough to have more than one reserve currency. The Americans know that very well, and they would love to have the euro um, as a reserve currency. It's not like the poor situation. It's a situation of um, enhancing ability of the financial system that took such a beating in 2008, and the Americans certainly want that. Now, I'm not saying that what the Americans want is on the side of the angels. What I'm saying is that the notion in money that the Americans are giving advice to Europe that will bring about the collapse of Europe, because this is in the interest of uh, the United States, this is possibly even more morbidly stupid than the silly that I hear from the Tea Party in the United States. Um, thanks, Yannis. If I remember correctly, you actually cover that in some detail in your book, uh, The Global Minotaur, about the establishment of, of both Europe and uh, and also Japan as um, how the U.S. economy needed those pillars in order to be able to um, 
develop and develop its next next phase of global dominance. So it certainly is central. Um, with Europe languishing in this way, I think you mentioned earlier that in the IMF and certainly a lot of economists see the BRICS as being the tractors that will pull Europe um, out of the mud. Um, how realistic is that assessment? And uh, how? Um, in fact, let's make it a wider question. What do we do about the eurozone crisis? What are what are the kind of what are the policy options that are available? How palatable are they, and what kind of pressure can we put on on uh, politicians to make them take more sensible choices? It would have been fantastic, would it not, if uh, countries like Brazil, Argentina, India, China, Southeast Asia, Africa, South Africa, would pull the the, the the global economy out of the mire, and you know, sort of poke. The West's nose, uh, and you know, sort of take the extreme pleasure of saying, "Yeah, you know what? The colonies have saved the day." At the end of the day, but it won't happen, and it can't happen. Of the BRICS, there are effectively two significant countries: China and Brazil. Brazil is a very uh, booming. Uh, enterprising, interesting economy. But let me make this the following uh, allegation. Neither Brazil, nor Argentina, nor Africa, or even India would be growing if it was not for China. China is the locomotive that is pulling the bricks. And of course Africa. Don't forget that Africa is completely and utterly reliant on uh, Chinese investment and demand. Now, China itself has done a splendid job since 2008 in maintaining its growth against the grain of a very significant reduction in demand for its wares, for its exports, from the United States primarily and Europe. And the way that the Chinese have managed to do that is by boosting investment, which was a very good thing. I'm not decisive. All I'm saying is that it's not sufficient. The Chinese economy and social economy has two major characteristics. One is internal migration, massive internal migration from the inland areas to the coastal areas, from the rural agricultural lands to the industrializing and industrialized uh, regions along the coast of China. When you have such a massive move of people, just to keep going, you need a growth rate of about 7 or 8 percent. Now, what we, the equivalent of British 0 percent growth is Chinese 7 percent growth. If China falls below 7 percent, it can't sustain itself. It's not stable, because when you say 0 percent growth, people usually assume that this means that you're remaining stable. Same in, no, it's not the case in China. You need 7% in order to remain still. Nothing remains still when you have a population of this particular. And the second characteristic is that, in spite of its uh, um, trademark as a communist country, there is no welfare state in, in China, which means that people who manage to make the transition from the rural to the industrial area save as if there is no tomorrow. Well, actually, as if there is no today. <laughs> Um, because he, they need to, 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 to have a bundle of money uh, if they want to edit the young people, if they want to look after themselves in the future, uh, when there will be no pension to speak of, uh, to look after their aging parents, uh, to take their kids to school. You know, there are no public schools effectively in China. There are public schools, but you still have to pay fees after uh, junior high school. Um, quite significant ones. So that means that the consumption rate in China is exceptionally low. Now when the crisis struck in 2008, it was around 50%, which was very low. Of every pound or dollar that many people was uh, uh, made as income, half of it was saved by the Chinese. That was very low. Do you know what it is now? It's 27%. 
So more than 70% of income produced in China is saved. Now, this may sound extremely puritanical, uh, Protestant, but from the perspective of generating demand for the rest of the world and for China, it is catastrophic. So China is boosting investment in order to keep its growth rate going, but its consumption rate is falling back. So it's like a cat chasing its own tail. As long as it keeps boosting investment, it can maintain the growth rate which is necessary so that the country does not become like something like Yeltsin's Russia in 1991. But it is incapable of generating sufficient demand for the rest of the BRICS and of course for Europe and the United States. So that was a long-winded answer to say no, I'm afraid that the BRICS cannot provide the locomotive that will pull the world economy out of its perimeter. Only the West can do that. However, with Europe engaged in a universal austerity and a recession we didn't have to have that is politically produced as a result of a spectacular alliance between the idiotic and the vested interests. And with the United States being ungovernable on the other side of the Atlantic because you have a White House which is at odds with Congress and always will be, so effectively there can be no uh, coherent economic policies there. We are caught up in a global economic and political coordination failure, which is making it possible to be realistically optimistic about the chances that any part of the global economy is going to pull any other part of the global economy out of the recession. So, um, basically, Yanis, it sounds like the problem is that there are things that can be done. There are policy options, but we we face we we face with political paralysis across the world, and it's not going to happen unless we somehow find a way to communicate very strongly with with politicians. Um, I noticed that um, uh, there were a couple of questions in. Uh, firstly, I'm gonna, I'm going to read um, George's question, and then um, I'm going to let Michael ask ask his question. Uh, George says, do you have any hope that things are going to turn around? We saw the effort of Italy and Spain for leaving bank recapitalization out of national debt, which was the first sane proposal in all the years of the European recession. This hasn't gone anywhere yet, and I don't see anything that gives hope that the crisis is being averted. Is there any sane economic planning, even if you don't agree with it? Um, and before you answer, um, Michael, did you want to ask something? Um, yes. I just uh, I just read an article. Uh, Yanis, you tweeted about uh, in Greek the, the light in bankruptcy, uh, where you correctly point out that bankruptcy is essential for capitalism. You are now muted. Uh, you have been arguing for bankruptcy of uh, eurozone member states, and that's excellent. Uh, but in every proposal that you make, you mention the need for bank recapitalization by the ESM. Um, what exactly, I mean, don't uh, banks have huge debts, even larger than uh, uh, sovereigns? And uh, the ESM, uh, where is it funded from? Isn't it funded uh, by states or the Eurozone? And uh, how many toxic paper is there in uh, banks you propose to recapitalize? Uh, not only part of derivatives or any kind of toxic paper. You are now on. Okay, let, let me take these two questions, two questions separately. The first one of what, what can be done? Uh, and you mentioned uh, in your question, or the, the question I mentioned in the question, the separation that was attempted back in the summit of June between the banking crisis and the sovereign debt crisis, which has not. Uh, been seen through by the powers that be, as a result, primarily of Berlin objections to them. Now, let's begin with that. In June, Mario Monti, the Italian Prime Minister, violently pressurized Mrs. Merkel to accept the notion that money that goes to the banks should not be added to the national debt of the country in which those banks are domiciled in order to decouple the two prices. That, that's a very sensible thing. Once all, 
the problem by itself, but one, as you said, the, the, the first uh, significant step down the road of rationality. And what has happened since then? Germany has been trying to undermine this agreement, never wanted to agree on that, it was bamboozled into doing that in the June summit, and the result is that this banking union idea is now dead left, it won't happen. It's very clear that it will be uh, confirmed in the breach and not in the observance. It will pretend to be doing something like a banking union, but it will be just a, a front covering the fact that there will be no banking union. It's clear to me that until and unless we, all of us, force their arm and actually give them no alternative but to move in the right direction, they will always find a way of slipping uh, out of the, 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 the path that leads to the possibility, not the certainty, of a crisis resolution. And how do we do that? Well, it won't happen until and unless one Eurozone member country, hopefully more, says no to the deal that is being shut down so. Imagine if the Greek government were to say to the European Central Bank this week that the bond, the Greek government bond which is maturing in your hands and which you are expecting us to redeem, even though we are bankrupt, you are expecting us, the Greek government, find the money from the bank of Greek banks who will find the money from you, <laughs> from the ECB, in order to repay the money to you. Basically. This is this Ponzi um, scheme. We're not going to do it, you know. And we, unless the, the Greek Prime Minister or the Portuguese Prime Minister or the Irish Prime Minister calls for a press conference under duress perhaps by his own people and he stares into the eyes of the German taxpayer, the German citizen, and, say, says, and says to this person, to the German citizen, we're being asked to take more loans from you, push them down a black hole, and under conditions which will ensure, will guarantee that we will not be able to repay you. We've been doing this now for a few years. We're not going to do it anymore, because this is dishonest, because we do not want to lie to you anymore, we don't want to lie to our people, but by doing this, under very harsh austerity conditions that squeeze the living daylights out, that we're going to somehow solve the problem. It's not going to solve the problem. We're a very small country. We cannot tell Europe what to do. But on the other hand, it is incumbent upon us, and it's our moral responsibility, to look at you in the eye, German taxpayer, and say, no, we're not going to take your money anymore. And then, you know what, sit down and say nothing more and go for a walk and have a coffee. I tell you, within 10 minutes, Europe's policy would have changed. Either the, the European, the Eurozone is going to, to disintegrate or they're going to find a much more a rational way of dealing with it. As long as we keep saying yes to measures of increasing irrationality, then this vicious cycle is, is going to continue. So that's the answer to the first question. The answer to the second question about bank capitalization and bankruptcies. Yes, it, you know, I, I have been saying it now since January 2010 that you know, bankruptcy is to capitalism that to, uh, uh, exactly what hell is to, to Christianity. Intensely unpleasant, but utterly necessary. The system cannot work without hell. Just like Christianity cannot work without hell because why not would you be good unless you fear damnation, if you believe in the dogma. Similarly, under capitalism, liberals, I'm not a liberal, I'm not a, neo, a liberal economist. I have great qualms about uh, capitalism and the possibility of civilizing that, the system. But nevertheless, let's forget it. The very proponents of capitalist dogma tell us that the great thing about capitalism is that it operates like a Darwinian process, weeding out the failures, weeding out the inefficiencies, weeding out those who cannot make it, and lending credence and power and success to the efficient and to the successful ones. Now, that means you need to have bankruptcies. That's, that's the weeding out pro process. So, there is nothing 
I mean, bandage is unpleasant, as I said, intensely unpleasant, but it's essential. Now, if that is the case for a corner store or a coal company in Yorkshire, if it is necessary for um, even a startup in Silicon Valley, which is, you know, starts off beautifully and then suddenly it bombs out and goes belly up, why can't we have a bankruptcy process both for banks and for states within the currency union? If we don't, then we're going to be in denial. If we, because the problem about bankruptcy is that it can not be solved by means of loans. It's one thing to have a liquidity crisis. If I have a liquidity crisis, you know, people owe me money and they're not giving it to me and I can't pay for my electricity bill, then this problem is solved very easily by extending me a line of code until I collect the money that's owed to me or until I produce the goods that are in, on the verge of being finalized and produced and manufactured and then I sell them and I make my my revenues and from that I repay my loans. But if I'm bankrupt, that means that my expected net income flow is not sufficient to cover my expected um, payments. And then I'm... Now, if somebody... I, if I, I am in that situation, somebody gives me more money in terms of loans, especially if they do that, as we do in Europe, on the condition that I will reduce my income because this is what austerity does, then simply this buys me more time but makes my bankruptcy much more certain and deeper. So, my point has been that the problem with Eurozone is that we have constructed this architecture which contains banks and states in a deadly embrace with one another. And that is effectively a dynamic, sequential domino effect where once the banks fail, like as in Ireland, then the state fails. Or, as in Greece, when the state fails, the bank fail. The banks fail. And what you need to do, once you realize that you have a situation of insolvency, of bankruptcy of the states and the banks, you need to do the only thing you can do, if you want to keep them going. Now, if it's a corner store selling balloons, you might as well let it go. It means that society probably doesn't have any need for the corner store selling balloons. Let it go. Let the Darwinian process take its course. But when it comes to a state, you can't let a state go. And when it comes to ba banking, you can't let the, banking sector, the whole banking sector go because it's not just a business, it's an essential aspect, um, network that keeps the bloodline, the, bl the blood flow flowing through the, uh, the organism of the social economy. But what you need to do is you need to weed out the owners of those banks. So if we decide as a society that a certain bank needs to be saved, that does not mean saving the owners. It means expropriating the shareholders, taking over the bank, recapitalizing it using ESM money, taxpayer money, cleansing it, perhaps closing some of those banks down because we may not need to have all of them still functioning. And then once they're cleansed and they return to uh, healthy profitability again, without any black holes left into them, then the ASM or whoever, whichever part of the, Euro, the Eurozone uh, political system has recapitalized these banks, you can just sell those shares back to the private sector and recoup the money that the taxpayer has given for the capitalization of the banks. What we do at the moment is not, none of that. What we do is we have the Spanish state borrowing on behalf of Spanish bankers so that the Spanish bankers that bankrupted their banks can stay in power within their banks, they retain control of their banks at the expense of the Spanish people. And because the, the money that will go to the Spanish bankers to retain control of the Spanish banks is going to be added to the national debt of the Spanish government, then the Spanish government will remain insolvent ad infinitum, and the whole thing could just collapse. Thank you, Yanis. That's a, um, a very comprehensive response. Um, you've been generous with your time, so we should probably wrap up in a minute. I just wondered if you'd like to finish by answering Xenophon's last question, which is, can you imagine any kind of multinational grassroots movement on an entrepreneur's level to implement that which the politicians are not able to implement, the recycling of surpluses, or is it doomed to fail against the failure of politics? I can't see it any time soon, but I'd love to be able to see it. And let's not forget that 
the night looks darkest just before the first uh, rays of light uh, pierce through the darkness. So perhaps the fact that we can't see it at the moment doesn't mean that it's not going to happen soon. I hope it does. But let me add that the only way it would happen is if the peripheries activists can forge an alliance with German workers mm -hmm. and Dutch workers and Finnish workers. We need to break down the completely misleading view that there is a conflict between German hardworking people and Greek or Portuguese hardworking people. There was never such a conflict. There never will be such a conflict except in the sick imagination of the elites and of the fascists. And it is incumbent upon us to speak into the ear and into the middle heart of the German workers and say to them, for 15 years your real wages have been squeezed and your services are now being cut down. And you're being told that this is what, the reason for that, because you've been subsidizing increasingly uh, the peripheries workers. You have been doing no such thing. You've been subsidizing the German bankers and the Greek bankers and the Greek um, grasshoppers in the financial sector and in the state sector. And now that the chickens are coming home to roost, you're being asked to do even more against the interests of the Greek workers and against your own interests. So what has happened is not solidarity towards Greece and Portugal. What has happened is that the powers that be in Europe found a very clever way of shifting losses from Deutsche Bank's books, books onto your shoulders, the German taxpayers, all in the name of solidarity periphery. So either we unite as workers, German, Dutch, Greek, Portuguese, all, we all fall together. Thank you, Yannis. I think that's a good note to end on. Michael does have a follow-up question. It's up to you whether you feel we have time to address that. He's, he's asking um, a, a bit more about bankruptcy. Um, would you like to answer let's, it quickly? Let, let me answer mm -hmm. it a second. Yes, sure. What is the question? You never mentioned bankruptcy reorganization in toxic paper clearance before ESM recapitalization. Oh, yes. I did. I did. I did. Look. If we have a proper banking union, we have a European Commissioner for supervising banks with the power to close them down, national supervisors. So the, the Greek supervising authority supposedly does this job with the Greek banks. But we know that the Greek supervisors are in the pockets of the Greek bankers. And the Spanish supervisors are in the pockets of the Spanish bankers and the German supervisor in the pockets of the German bank. But if we have a, a, a European far removed supervisor of all these banks, whose job is to do something very simple, to look carefully in, into the books of those banks, not in the way that the EBA has been doing those fake stress tests, with a view to cleansing them and winding down the banks that need to be closed down, finding very... Um, investigating the links between these banks and their subsidiaries which are replete with the toxic paper that your question that Michael has been asking and separating those subsidiaries from the main banks closing down the subsidiaries and taking a, a, a public stake in the, the remaining healthy banks which then is the result of the I don't care to whom uh, once those banks have been cleansed then we will end up with healthy banks that have been cleansed of the toxic waste. But the only way of doing this is central. There is no way that the national elites are going to subject the national banks to this degree of scrutiny, because they are owned by the national bankers. So the point here is how to save the banks and get rid of the bankers. And that can only be done centrally. You see, in the United States of America, which is not exactly a country, the last time I looked, you know, they've been winding down about a hundred banks a year. How many banks have we, have we wound down in Europe? None. Janis, thank you very much. That was fantastic and insightful, um, as, as always. Um, as Xenophon says, you are needed in Germany. Um, I think he's probably right, so you can speak directly to the hearts and minds of the German people. Um, 
thank you for joining us and we hope to speak to you again and also thank you to everyone who contributed. Thank you, folks, and congratulations on your efforts. Thank you, and uh, goodbye. <laughs>